I want to thank the organizers for the invitation and uh, John and Andre for provocative papers. Uh, I went through at one point to all the 160 <laughs> slides that John <laughs> prepared. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, all the revisions. Um, and also, Marcus gave a very, very interesting um, discussion. So I'm going to try to to concentrate on the things that have not been said. I may have to skip some slicing because they've been repeated. So, um, 50 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> crisis, you know, what, what the paper on stability from belief starts from the idea that Crises are due to non-rational beliefs amplified by traditional mechanisms, excess optimism, excess lending and investment, and then a correction of expectations, perhaps brought by bad news or winning optimism, and then a recession. So Andre discussed his program, uh, which is very interesting, and uh, of measuring and analyzing expectations, especially from surveys, to think about this what he called portable models of beliefs, which I think is extremely important things that applied to many different circumstances. That's one of the advantages of rational expectations. You can think of rational expectations in a lot of different in a lot of different contexts. And um, how in incorporating that. The implementation, that's what he talked about and I'll discuss today, is like an overweighting of representative types, what he calls diagnostic expectations. Now he went through these equations already. The only things I want to remind us of is that you start, let's suppose, an AR1, the true process, and you overreact to likelihood change. When you get something which is more than you expected the period before, that is xt minus 1, if xt is better than what you expect, xt minus 1, then you kind of over, or then you expect better for xt plus 1. So you get an equation like this, which is a positive surprise relative to your expectation, xt minus 1 gives you uh, a larger, makes you predict a larger xt plus 1. Now, one important thing here, and Andre didn't emphasize, although it's, I should say the paper really talks about that, the three author paper that he based on this, but he didn't have time to talk here, is that next period agents forget all the previous forecasts and look for uh, deviations for rational expectations forecasts again. So it reminded me, you know, it's been a long time since I studied philosophy when I was in high, in high school, you know, on Nietzsche's eternal recurrence, which I never understood if it was something you thought existed or you thought people feared. That I could never, I never went that far. But it's this idea that the eternal hourglass of existence is turned upside down and you with it. So you start all over again. Now, if you want a pop reference instead, think of the movie uh, Groundhog Day. Everything starts again the same day. It's exactly the same concept. Uh, I'm not sure they read Nietzsche before they made the movie, but it's <laughs> exactly the same concept. Now, and the reason I think they're quite uh, uh, candid in the paper, if surprises are relative to agents' past forecasts, then overreaction implies reference expectations are higher in the next period. So on average, you're going to get a bad surprise. So you're going to get too many cycles. You want something that you get a continuous number of good surprises. And he goes to this example, which is basically an example in which, it's f as, he's, as Andre said, a very uh, uh, kind of... Uh, canonical model in which you have credit spreads, you have, you have investment, and you have forecasts of productivity. So productivity itself behaves like an AR1, and credit spreads overreact because productivity expectations overreact. So you get a good surprise, you think things are going to be even better, and that means that you, you quote, lower credit spreads because productivity is expected to be so high. Now, you have the same story. So Again, you get this fact that overreaction to productivity shock today affects credit spread today, but doesn't affect future credit spreads. So what I think one has to kind of tweak a little bit in these models is that if I look at the innovation credit spread, the half-life is going to be even shorter, you know, because you're going to have a big thing to today, tomorrow, today, and then tomorrow, you know, in the half-life is, is going to make it even shorter. So uh, then the retro expectations. So the question is how do you match you know, the half-life of these impulse responses on things like credit spreads to, to the data is going to make harder for them. That doesn't mean it can't be fixed. It's a matter of thinking about how the expectations work and so on. Okay. So let me make just some remarks. Um, 
it is a simple model that has potential for quantification. That's a big plus. You know, we can really discuss if the stuff is right or not. There's the problem, and uh, they are very, again, in the paper, and also in what Andre discussed it here. There is a, it delivers um, under overreaction, but there are some examples, at least on aggregate data, of underreaction. So that's something uh, um, one has to be added. Uh, but in any case, it's, it's a useful addition to the macrodynamics toolkit, and it will be, I think, this idea that beliefs are kind of more volatile than which deemed by a rational expectation model makes a lot of sense. Andre also skipped fast in the paper. He talks more about, and even his presentation, a little bit about representative agent model. We know that in some cases it's irrelevant. You know, the Crusell and Smith work shows that. But recent work by Kaplan and Violante show that even macro, it may matter in some cases. And I do think, and this is touching a little bit on, this, uh, on the idea that Mark has already talked about, that at some point, I think, and he had a, there was a little bullet on this, um, I think it's important also to introduce speculation. Not only have difference in beliefs, but also speculation. You know, I don't, you know, the evidence we have on trading volume and supply responses and big booms and busts seems to indicate that these episodes are involve more than repeated surprise on fundamentals. There's something going on besides repeat. People speculate on those things. Um, all right. So now I'm going to go to John's uh, portion. Uh, and again, um, his purpose is to get a general equilibrium theory of trading in assets and non-recourse loans. That's going to play a big role. Let's think about that, non-recourse loans using assets as collateral. Okay, and the equilibrium, of course, is going to determine both asset prices and the characteristics of the trade and loan contracts. Now, there are, of course, other theories that involve collateral, involve, involve um, loans and so on. Perhaps for the corporate finance people, the most eminent, of course, is Merton's. Merton's theory in which of debt valuation, and he assumes that lenders have recourse to the whole equity of the firm. That's basically the recourse of a lender. They don't get paid, they take over the, the equity of the firm. So that's a, a, a theory of recourse loans. The macro literature, you know, of course, Kiyotak and Moore. Moore, you see, I get a 30 seconds for that extra. <laughs> <laughs> And the papers by Bernanke and Gertler, and also by Bernanke, Gertler, and Gilchrist. Um, now, there's a paper that wasn't mentioned up to now here, which is the, the paper by Kehoe and Levin, uh, where in which agent defaults are punished by the exclusion from future claims market and loss of part of their assets. That's the mechanism there. And that's, of course, a, a matter of collateral. You know, the collateral is whatever. The, the rights to participate in this claim markets and also they can lose part of their assets. And in this case, default does not occur in equilibrium, it's just like the binomial models that John uses. But the possibility of default affect prices and the amounts borrowed. Uh, I don't remember the paper well enough to see if they did any comparative studies on this or not. Now there's also, you know, and this yes, they came up during uh, Ken Rogoff's talk, there was a large literature on collateral and a large discussion, those of us who came from emerging markets, Ricardo's around here, and of course, Guillermo, et cetera, and Carmen, um, know that, that uh, there was a big discussed items with respect to sovereign debt. And of course, Ken Rogoff's talk yesterday talked a little bit about that. So uh, I'll go very briefly over the structure of the model just to remind you of, because John, that's the part that John spent time on. The main important thing that John assumes is the fact that the payoff you're going to receive is just going to be the minimum between the collateral you post at phi and the payoff of the asset. Okay, so that's what a non-recourse loan is all about. And equilibrium determines both the price of the asset, the, original, the price of the original asset, the traded contract that you're going to have, is what you're going to have to promise, and the price that is the interest rate. So that's the, the way the model works. The theory can accommodate, of course, more state-dependent promises, collateral that includes cash, including in principle you can describe shorts that way, and it can accommodate divergence of beliefs. Now, let me, I'll talk about only two of the three implications, one of which, because John was, went very fast over it, and I think is one of the most important, that was probably slide 140, 150, <laughs> uh, and I made a mistake of thinking that you're gonna talk about that. The other, because I think it's quite important. First is that leverage cycles are pro-cyclical, that's a big, 
big point here. And the second is a narrative for the MBS crash. And I give a very fast version of his ner narrative, which is that emphasizes the feedback effect from the fall in prices on mortgage-backed securities on the tightening of lo housing loan terms and that affecting housing prices. Um, so, and he also emphasized the role of changes in regulation that allowed the introduction of credit default swaps on MBSs and eventually also on, s on CDO tranches. So, um, let's talk about measuring leverage. There are several ways of measuring leverage. You can do the, a market value or a book value. And of course, Merton's model uses mar market value, and so do some models in microfinance like Hay and Krishn I can't pronounce it, Krishnamurthy, 2013. Um, there's also a question of holding companies versus broker-dealer leverage. Mo a lot of the early empirical work on leverage was usi done using flow of funds. And the flow of funds, you can't really get the holding companies leverage. You can only get what they call holding company leverage, not holding company le leverage. It takes a long time to, to explain that. But uh, there's a paper by Hay and Brian Kelly, and the third co-author. It's they all listed at the end documents that market value of holding companies leverage is counter-cyclical. Uh, and so you get the opposite cyclical properties. So one thing we know, leverage cycles, but we don't know how. You know, looking at, the, at this data and this fact, and there are papers that claim it's pro-cyclical and people that claim it's counter-cyclical. We better sort it before, we, before too long, before you theorize more about this stuff. So, um, so, let me talk one mi minute about measuring leverage. One question about me measuring leverage, how we should we treat long-term debt? And uh, you and Ma, who's a student of Andre, had been comparing um, bank long-term debt financing with non-banks and has found out that banks have much weaker control rights than, I mean, debt has much weaker control rights than comparable non-financial firms. So it seems to me that's much closer to equity than what that, that issue by non-financial firms. And uh, there's, of course, a special treatment for repo swaps and other derivatives that made them super senior, in a sense. So that's another problem that we have to think about. And so when you count for those things, you know, you, you measure leverage. You know, you got from, uh, from Bear Stearns, if you think that their long-term debt was not runnable, was much like equity, then you get a leverage of five instead of 33. So that's, maybe five is too big, okay? Now, uh, there's also the question of overvaluation, you know? Uh, I will go a little faster here, but there's this very interesting paper by Heising and Levin that documents that bank use accounting discretion to overstate the book value of their assets in 2008. And that brings us to the question whether or not there was, these margins were as high as, as, as people talk about. Because you're talking about a margin over, quoted the margin that the bank, which was borrowing, thought they were borrowing at. But that was their prices. And the people lending to them had entirely different prices in mind. So what I, I'm not saying that these prices didn't fall. They did fall. There may have been a run on the assets but it's less likely there was actually a run on the margins at that point. Um, and, uh, and, and that has led to some thought. You know, if you think about this, about this, this overstating, then you, you start to think that stress test perhaps a better idea than simply using leverage. I'm gonna like to last two minutes for my narrative on the crash, and my narrative on the crash is that um, John G's narrative on the crash emphasizes this feedback. And I think, I actually think that the credit, the credit bubble has, shares origins with a lot of earlier bubbles. You know, if I were to think of a bubble which is similar to that, I would see the South Sea bubble. Because it was also one which was motivated by a financial innovation. You had a financial innovation, people, you guys went crazy. I mean, the Brits, I mean, including you guys up there. Okay, <laughs> so, so in here, I think there was a similar story you know, all of a sudden had all this financial engineering that justify lower risk premium. There's also general acceptance of the great moderation. And the other point is that the bubble was above, was beyond just housing, okay? With apologies to Dimitri and John, you know, in March 2006, that, that, that's, I chose March 2006 because that's the peak of the, of the, of the uh, housing, pri uh, of housing prices. Um, Greek debt had a five-year CDS trading on the teens. With apologies to you guys, I think that's demented. 
You know, people were thinking that that's how you could ensure that low spread. Now, to touch on Latin America, you could also see that uh, the CDS on Argentina uh, was only about 3%. So let me tell you what I think has happened. The literature on bubbles emphasized the role of supply in deflating bubbles. And there's a paper that Hong and uh, Wei Shang and I wrote. And also more recently, some work on shorting that I've done, the, what happens shorting in bubbles. And the CDO machine was a machine to transform mezzanine bonds, that is, credit wasn't so good, into AAA bonds. And so the supply was limited, of course, by issues of subprime mortgage. About 90% of the B bonds uh, were placed in CDO, and optimist investors who supported the supply of loans to subprime and out borrowers, helping sustain bubble. But regulation changed. And that when regulation changed, um, what happened is that people were able to short, create synthetic CDOs, which was a form of shorting the, 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 the CDOs. And just to give you an idea, the amount of CDOs that was created through the shorting was equal to the amount of to equal to the amount of CDOs that have been created between 1998 and 2007. So you double the supply with no new houses being built. That's basically what synthetic CDOs did. And the famous, the most famous one, and that's my last slide, which is the Abacus uh, 2007 AC1, was a synthetic CDO, which of course is now very infamous. It was composed of CDS totaling $2 billion. The original face value of all the cash bonds, which were BBB bonds, was 1.2 billion. So in this particular CDO, they, you kind of more than double. Just to give you uh, an idea, you know, if you have a 10% shorting of a stock, people go crazy. This was a hundred and whatever percent. Thank you. <laughs>